so, <clears throat> whew, y'all, it's been a, it's been an amazing ass two days. Uh, I am glad we are on the downward trend to closing this on out. I have loved all of this. I hope that y'all have made some friends. I hope, I hope that everybody like has like gotten closer to their dreams of either getting into the industry or getting a job. Uh, just super, super thankful for you guys to spend this time with us. And I will let JB introduce himself and his team. And uh, then we'll go from there. Cool. Hello, everybody. Nice. Already uh, an applause. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm JB. My name is John Bamondi. Um, but I am the head recruiter for Infinity War to Austin, which we make Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, all that Warzone, DMZ, all that, that great stuff. Um, and it's really awesome to be here in Austin. Um, and one, one of the really like, unique things that we have here is that we're actually starting uh, Infinity Ward Austin um, it, in Austin, right? It's a brand new studio that we're building pretty much from scratch. Uh, over the past year and a half, we went from zero to around 50 people. Um, and so IW, as you know, that you've known and grown to love with the original Modern Warfares and the creator of the original Warzone, they're based out of LA. And so with all that success and how well the game has been doing and crushing, they decided to build this new studio. And so all the people that you see here have come from various backgrounds um, to help you know, build MW2. And what we're going to be tackling in the future is, is still in the works um, as we are ever changing and evolving. But it has been uh, really incredibly exciting. And as like, uh, I know I'm the recruiter and people are like the recruiter, they're never like, in the weeds with the game, but I 1,000% am. I am play testing every day. I'm spitting all my terrible ideas at our MP director, and he's like, "You're these are awful." Um, but uh, but no, it's it, it really truly is amazing working there, and and uh, the level of like, if you just like keep tapping in, you can just like keep seeing what's out there and what the company and the studio is building in the future, and like three years from now, four years from now, what the plans are, and and how we just keep trying to evolve, and it's. And it's been great, but, but with that, um, you know, I think one of the unique challenges that we're trying to do is, is build our studio from uh, an underrepresented background. I think a lot of these companies are trying to catch up and being almost like we, we kid that we're like the, the most well-funded startup out there. Um, and, and having that unique opportunity, we see that and we really want to try and help build. And, um, and that's why I'm really excited to be here today and speaking here is because I think we're all very passionate about it. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's the quick recruiter spiel that I have about IW. Uh, but um, I do have Ben Scott, who was our MP director uh, for Austin. And I also have Chris Schmidt, who's our game director. And then in the, the stands here, I got uh, Michael Hogue is our head of production here in Austin as well. Um, and so we're here to answer any questions, any comments, if you want tips and tricks on how to work here at IW or, um, you know, we are absolutely hiring right now. Um, you know, I know across just the world right now, we see all these companies doing layoffs and things like that, and it's rough out there. But, you know, we are very excited that we are still in a growth period and, and we do, we are hiring across our, our UI UX teams, our design teams and our engineering teams. Uh, and our art teams, those are the, the main core. And then, of course, LA is still building and growing and hiring, um, and they've got everything. I would say like our animation side of the house is still pretty tied to LA at this point, but that is something we plan to grow in the future, but those are kind of the core areas. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's my, that's my quick pitch. I don't know if you gentlemen would like to say anything, but um, do you want to say something? Yeah, perfect. Um, this is, uh, some of us at, at this studio, at the new studio, have been in the Austin game dev scene for a very long time, which is, which is why we're pretty excited. We also have a lot of people we're bringing in um, from all over the world. And so what I think this is a really unique opportunity is uh, I came here in 2009. A lot of us did actually when um, BioWare was expanding uh, for BioWare Austin. And so we were, I think we both worked together there for over a decade. Um, and so that's kind of the, the magic about Austin game dev scene is it's very, uh, it's been around a very long time. It's known as a, an expertise in not only creativity, but like live services. Um, we used to joke 
uh, at Bioware, actually, we would call Austin the live service capital of the world. We would kind of play on the, the live music. And so that's why uh, we're really excited to be here. And there's a unique uh, breed of talent here. And also a lot of, since Austin is such a new city with a lot of folks moving here, uh, a lot of uh, people with different backgrounds. And as we all know, in a creative industry, the more different points of view we have, the better product we get, the better our games are, the more fun they are. And so that's what we're really excited about is, is just trying to reach out and uh, talk, meet, meet with all of y'all and talk to y'all and, uh, and really answer any questions you have about uh, us or, or what, we're, what we're looking for. One, two. Um, I am uh, heavily immersed in the virtual reality scene in Austin. And I guess my question is, when are we going to get Call of Duty in VR? And when can I work on that? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, we don't have an answer for you. Um, honestly, I don't know. It's certainly not on our roadmap. Will it be? I think, you know, the thing with COD is that it's a huge game, right? And so VR is still very early. Like, is there enough critical mass for us to take the time and investment into it? Probably not now, but I know that there's people certainly that are keeping that on their radar because we're always looking to expand into other areas to bring Call of Duty into, you know, emerging technology or emerging areas where we haven't really penetrated yet. So hopefully soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No doubt about it, no doubt about it. I think there's a possibility there, but right now we're really just concentrating on bringing more Call of Duty to the, to the vast masses that we can. But yeah, if, if we do, it'll certainly, I don't think it'll be a quiet announcement, let's put it that way. I'm so excited right now. So I spoke before here, and Modern Warfare 2 is my favorite game. I used to play it every day before work. And then I would work, and then I would go home and play it again. And um, You too? <laughs> here we are. <laughs> and I've been in the industry for 25 years or so, and now I'm reunited with a game studio full of friends, and they know I like Modern Warfare too. And they all got the console and the game so they can play Modern Warfare 2 with me. And we also started a recruiting business as a vendor, as game developers. So if you need any help, I've got you. I love Modern Warfare too. <laughs> and so does our company. <laughs> Thank you, that's it. Absolutely. We can, definitely, we can definitely chat. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have any other questions? They will definitely be in the audience here. So. Hello. I've been very curious. I mean, you guys have uh, a, a very wide, expansive game. Uh, you have a huge community for it, and you have a lot of feedback for it, a lot of vocal people, even though it's a very small subset of your actual audience. And how do you balance that with your guys' own vision to make sure that it doesn't alienate? It, it's not easy, right? So you have the dynamic of the external feedback, uh, which you know, we certainly pay attention to Reddit and Twitter and those things, uh, for good or worse, you know. Uh, we have da internal data that we collect, obviously, uh, analytics. We have data teams. Chris can speak more eloquently about that than I can. Uh, and then we have the dev teams, which also play the game regularly uh, and have feedback. And then we have people who give us feedback on the design side of their own personal take. So I. I want to tell you like there's some magic to it or something like that, but really it just comes down to a collective of people that want Call of Duty to be successful. And we know that we can't please everyone all the time. So we're just trying to do what we think is best for the game and best for the broadest amount of people who play the game. We all know that there's usually a vocal minority that wants something like, bring back slide canceling, please, because you know I'm a streamer. And like that makes me look cool and gets more and more. So, so for us and for me specifically, you know, it's a lot of like, 
what is the actual motivation for that person's feedback? Are they genuinely looking to like give feedback that makes Call of Duty better as a game? Or is it really that they just have their own personal interest in the thing that they liked that they want to see return? Sometimes those things are aligned. Sometimes the thing that some individual wants is better for the game in general. Sometimes they're not. So it's, it's really just a matter of, in a lot of ways, trusting your instinct, using data to verify what actually is the truth. Because again, people will lie to you and tell you what they want, but then the data completely goes against that. Uh, but data's not perfect either, and then you have the analysis of the data, which then modifies it. So it's, it's a tricky thing. That's what I'll say about it. But we, we do our best. We do our best. There, there's not a big conspiracy. I know everyone thinks there's some kind of cabal or conspiracy inside of Infinity Ward or whatever. That's, that's not true. We're just human people working at a job that we love and trying to make the best possible game for everybody. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I've spent a lot of time in my career um, kind of handling that fine line, that balance. Uh, our goal, my goal, is to have the most amount of people have the most enjoyment in the product, like the end, right? Um, as you all know, we're in like a, a, a bit of a, a race for... Um, attention with with Netflix with right all of tech is, is begging for people's attention and games are no different and so what we try to do is widen the funnel get as many different new kinds of players in the game as possible and the way communities react is is very interesting um, I worked on anthem for a couple of years and that I could do a whole TED talk on that um, but that's an example of a game if we take it to an extreme um, a game that had warts and flaws and, and all those things, um, but the perception and the messaging online took over and, and kind of went wild, uh, turning it into a game that the perception was it was a whole lot worse than it, it, than it was. Um, if you look online now, if you look in Anthem subreddits, that kind of thing, they're like, oh, this is the most underrated game of all time. I'm like, tap on the brakes. Um, but the, the reality is perception is reality, and so you have to kind of balance the, the, the influencer chat. Um, and I was t chatting with a couple people earlier that you've, we've seen this with League of Legends, for example. We see like Diamond League players being very loud and vocal about um, changes that they would make, and then you'd see brand new players that are lower skill parroting those same kind of talking points when it's at odds with a benefit to them. Um, and so, it's, it's, that's the power of influencers and communities, and it's, it's a very tough uh, line to walk, but uh, to Ben's point, that's what we do. We dive into data quite a bit. Turns out players are really bad at telling you what they want, uh, but data typically doesn't lie, so we have to look at data, but also understand the context we're looking at the data in. Um, so, in general, a lot of it comes down to when we're making decisions about changing something in the game, um, I'm very passionate about answering the question, who is it for and why, first. Um, and when we, when we narrow in at who exactly this is for, uh, then that can drive our decision making, right? Um, but it's almost never going to be, the answer is almost never going to be, this is for these 50 players, <laughs> right? It's, it's, we want more people playing. We don't want to be exclusive. We want to be inclusive. Uh, and that's the goal in, in just about any live service, I think. Uh, so. It's, it's hard, <laughs> but yeah, that's my best, best shout at it. Right on, and I see someone up front as well, so hold on one second. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, so I'm Bill, for everyone. I do a, a podcast entitled A Gamer Looks at 40, and on that show I interview streamers and bloggers and developers and gamers of all sorts and hear their stories on how video games affected their lives and the heart and soul of the medium. So my question to you guys is, was there ever a moment, either in at Infinity Ward or your other experience, where you had a problem or an issue, and you looked at that and said, oh God, what do we do? Where it felt like a, an insurmountable situation, and more importantly, how did you surmount it? Uh, a, a lot, honestly. Uh, making games is super hard, as a lot of people in here know. Um, yeah, it's... That's the thing that really attracted me to game development in general is uh, I didn't want to get bored in my career doing the same thing every day. And certainly this is a lot of different problem solving every single day and it seems like almost every problem is impossible. Um, I think what we try to do 
is at least my approach is to take a kind of a, have a systemic approach to a, to a problem, right? Let's narrow it down to a problem statement that's very clear. Uh, there can be n solutions, there can be 10 solutions for this one problem, but let's all agree on what the problem is, right? And then that can kind of inform the path we take. There, doesn't, there don't have to be 10 solutions. Well, now if we all agree and then we've narrowed the problem as much as possible, now there could be four or five solutions, right? And from there, you can, you can start doing risk assessment and seeing, you know, well, what's our cost, what's our time, what's our, you know, all of our constraints, that kind of thing. Um, so I guess really the ability, and it's a skill we, we, we train for in design, the ability to take a large problem and break it into lots of tiny problems that we can approach. Um, it's difficult, right? And one of the difficult things is getting the whole boat to steer in the same direction. You have a lot of people with a lot of, in a lot of different departments with a lot of different conflicting uh, views and, and that kind of thing. And it's, it's trying to really narrow everyone to the same problem and steer in the same direction. And, and the, that's the power of having like a, a good dev team, a good team around you, a good relationship, like a great culture, a trust culture. Uh, then you find that when you trust each other and you, you cut through all the the politics and that, then everyone's rowing in the same direction. All of a sudden, we can do things that we may have thought were impossible. And I don't mean working all night and crunching. I mean, like, you know, we're all aligned and we're all doing our best work uh, in a reasonable day, for example. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's how I approach it. I don't know what you've got. I don't, I don't know. We have enough time to unpack all that. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's been so many problems in my career that seemed insurmountable. Chris and I worked together on Anthem. He and I were basically the two people in the Anthem Discord trying to like personally support people through their broken online errors and stuff like that. We were feeding tickets into the, and you know, that, you know. So it's, it's just a roller coaster, really. I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest thing to, to try and overcome, I think, is just not get caught up in the, the, the difficulty of the problems and, and it's insurmountable. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's literally every day there's some massive problem that you never would have thought you had to deal with. And now on Call of Duty, like this scope is just, you know, it's 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 almost distracting to think about the size of Call of Duty, like as you're working on it. It's it's, it's pretty crazy, but it's exciting. But so I don't know. What about you? You got a lot of problems. <laughs> Honestly, last year, uh, building the studio, going from, I was number 10 to, you know, 50 here. I was like, how am I going to do this, right? Um, and kind of like to Chris's point, just taking it day by day and working with the people around you that are going to help build you and support you. We, we talk about all the time, but everybody we hire, what's really important to us are those behavioral traits, not just the, the, the technical pieces, and making sure that everybody fits and molds and supports you, making sure that everybody feels supported and, and Honestly, I've been to so many South By events and a lot of DE&I events. Like the number one thing I took away from it was that everybody cared about the inclusive culture first. That was the number one thing. Is like for, for the folks that you have from underrepresented, how do you retain those people? How do you make sure they feel supported? Um, and we've been trying to do everything we can to, to build it. You know, and so that's been super important and it's, been a challenge. I got to work at pretty cool companies like Google and Meta prior to, to Infinity Ward. But this has been like the most, I, I was telling my lead literally last week, this has been the, the biggest accomplishment I've ever had in my life. And just because I absolutely love IW and I love Call of Duty and I love Modern Warfare, I've already sunk hundreds of hours into it and plan to sink hundreds of more. Um, and yeah, it's just the people, like generally, genu genuinely and generally, uh, I guess for me and these guys sh showed me tons of support, and um, we got to just keep building. So, yeah. Right on. We uh, we we uh, a little bit of time because I know some people have to hit a train. So. Yep. I was just gonna say few, we, uh, we got a train and we got a DJ coming. So, <laughs> uh, I got time for one more question. What was uh, and then you guys are gonna be some of yes, y'all will be I'll, out. I'll be out here. Yeah. Yeah, as well. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. This is. Uh, there was a remaster, or I guess art replacement remake, of uh, the original Modern Warfare, which uh, really impressed me from a technical level in that there seemed to be a lot of model, animation, and art and texture replacement, quite a bit beyond what most remasters go for. Uh, and I was a little curious about what was the decision point behind that. Now, that may not have been you guys personally, but 
maybe there was some whisperings in, uh, can, in back rooms about how that came about? I, I don't necessarily know the answer. I was just going to say that our, our studio and the people that we have here are very new, right? And so when they made that remaster, not MW2, but the like remaster of MW2, which is what I think you're alluding to, we honestly weren't here because we're brand new, right? Uh, we've been here within the past year. I don't know if you have a solution or if that was going to be your answer, but... That's part of it, but that was actually outsourced. Like, it wasn't done internally in, in Infinity Ward. Like, it was outsourced through Activision, and I actually think certain Affinity here did some of it uh, in Austin. So, yeah, unfortunately, we weren't here, and I haven't heard anything about it as, as far as... I don't think anybody in my world at Infinity Ward was involved in that process. It was more of, like, a corporate publishing entity that, that made all those decisions. So, sorry. One, one, one quick thing I will say as a plug for, I think, IWA is that, like, the number one thing I hear from the people that we have start is they didn't realize how fast they would actually contribute to the game and seeing their work out in the public. Uh, we had somebody join, like, literally three months ago, and they were, like, a key member in the Path of the Ronin for Season 2, um, and, like, our UI UX team in Austin were, like, a main person in that. So, you know, one of the really nice things is, you know, if you're, if you're working in a startup or you're working trying to build a brand new game from scratch, it's gonna take a while to build it. Whereas like NIW, you jump in here, your stuff's gonna go out in months, right? Uh, also it depends on timelines, and we have multiple studios that work on Call of Duty across multiple games. But uh, that's been a really cool factor, just as like another fun point. <laughs> well, I think to back up JB's point is, I think a lot, and I certainly thought this, being outside of Infinity Ward uh, prior to coming to it, is you'd think it's just kind of like, very big kind of monolithic corporate beast. And Infinity Ward, even in the Call of Duty universe of studios, is actually the smallest studio, typically, of all of them. It's very, it's very startup feeling. Like, you have a lot of power, essentially. You have a lot of responsibility that you can very quickly get into the game and do a lot of stuff. So it's... From my perspective, I worked at EA and I worked at some other game studios. It's certainly the least, but I'd say, corporate feeling game studio I've ever worked with, even though you're working on like the second largest game in the history of the universe. So it's it's pretty it's pretty daunting, but it's super fun and and it's really rewarding to just be able to kind of come in, learn it quickly, and like I I just barely have been at Infinity Ward for a little over a year, and I shipped two maps in Call of Duty in one year. So it's pretty crazy. I want to, uh, so I know that we're, we're pressed with time, or did you have some more to add, or? Nope. All right, so before we close this out, there's one thing I definitely want you to do is, can you repeat again which positions that you guys are hiring for, and that sort of information? Yeah, so uh, over time, like if I'm talking right now, who do I need to hire? Um, gameplay engineering, UI engineering, um, Environment artists, um, character artists. Um, oh, come on, I, I got this off the top of my head. Um, UI technical designers, UI artists, and a systems engineer. Those are all of the roles. We have multiple of certain roles, um, but those are like the main focus. Now, on the broader scope, like if you don't fit into those few roles that I talked about, we are, again, a growing studio. We only have 50 people. We have plans to grow exponentially more than that. So, like, there will be a time when we do hire. It's just not at this moment for those. But we will need those people because we are going to be, a, again, full-functioning studio. And if you're trying to, like, prep and get ready for that, I'm happy to have those discussions with you about how to get there, what I look for, what our leads look for, what our directors look for. Um, and if you are there and you're just, like, trying to find a timeline, connect with me. I for sure ain't going anywhere because I absolutely love IW. Uh, so let's connect. Cool. Right on. And so to help you out with some of those hirings, I definitely want to present all of you with a ATX Game Maker's Book of Talent. Cool. Thank you so much. Right on. Awesome. And so in that book, you will find some portfolios and resumes from our beautiful community that will help you on your quest to uh, hire diversely and uh, get some of those positions filled. As I said before, they'll be out in the audience uh, for a little bit, and then there's definitely some people I'd like to introduce y'all to as well, just sure. from some of the positions that you named. And thank you guys for, for coming out, and I know it's DICE, this, GDC, so, <laughs> you know, I get it. So thank you guys for cool. your time. Thank you. <laughs>